Folks, we're gonna we're gonna kick it off. So uh, if you can wrap your conversations up, I'm going to hand the reins of this here policy pitches panel off to Bob Hayden, president of Standard Power. Hi, folks. Sure. Cheer for yourself for being here. It's great to see you all. Um, we got a really cool panel for you, and I'm going to talk for about a minute and a half or two minutes on a policy pitch I want to do. I asked Victoria, is she in here? How much of her bio should I read? Because it's so impressive. So please read all of it. But she is the commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Um, that means her budget. 650? $650 million. She has 1,650 employees working for her in a safe and efficient transportation system. Highly impressive. The rest of it's awesome, too. On my right here, Ethan Goldman. Principal, Resilient Edge, you've done all kinds of cool stuff too, right? Has developed software for sustainability since 2001. You're not old enough. Was it a college project? Um, creating systems to find and quantify energy efficiency and demand flexibility. So uh, that's pretty cool. And then, of course, Don Kreese, consumer advocate, hero of the people. Hero of me. So I hope I get you to turn a little red. No? So um, standard, <laughs> standard Power is uh, working on some fun new stuff. And one of the things is called Blue World. And Sam asked me to give it a quick introduction here. Um, Blue World is a process that will make uh, biochar and activated carbon. Uh, there's a high possibility that the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture will be funding this program initially for alpha testing with dairy farmers here in New Hampshire, Maine, and Maine and Vermont. Um, the process also is carbon negative. So it makes about 50 million kilowatt hours a year in a carbon negative way. We're looking for transportation systems other than diesel tractor trailers, maybe EVs, or uh, even this week we were looking at ammonia as a uh, fuel for these, this transportation system because we don't want to diminish the carbon credit value. So that's my policy pitch. Oh, what is the one thing I need for that? There's one word. Um, right now, for eligible fuels for group net metering, biomass is in there, but it's called wood pellets. The one word I want out is pellets. I'd rather have it be clean wood. That's me. And I think we have Victoria first. Well, you want slides? I don't know how to do that. Come on, Josh. Nope. There it is. All right. So you all signed up for an energy conference, and then they asked the commissioner of DOT to speak. And they also asked me to talk on the topic of transportation funding. So you might be wondering um, why I'm going to be giving you Transportation Funding 101 this afternoon. Uh, but hopefully, as I progress through my presentation, it will become clear. And so uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Victoria Sheehan. I've had the privilege of serving as the commissioner for the Department of Transportation since 2015. Um, who are we at DOT? Well, our mission and purpose is up on the screen. Um, our mission is to provide transportation excellence, enhancing the quality of life in New Hampshire. And so we are committed to providing safe, um, efficient, and reliable transportation solutions. Um, but a big part of the work that we do is ensuring that we are good stewards of the environment and that the work that we're doing is such that we are enhancing the quality of life in New Hampshire, hence our mission statement. Um, this is how we're organized, and I apologize if it's flashing in and out. Um, we are a large organization. Um, <laughs> when fully staffed, we are uh, 1,635 uh, uh, full-time employees. And um, we are not just the organization of orange cones in the summer and orange trucks in the winter. Um, we have uh, responsibilities associated with all modes of transportation. Um, so we, of course, yes, maintain um, the roadway network, and we deliver a lot of uh, large-scale construction projects, but we also work very closely with all of the public transit agencies in the state, 
as well as the airports and the railroad operators. And so really every mode of transportation um, is coordinated through the Department of Transportation with the exception of the port. That's the only uh, facility that runs independently. And as was mentioned, our budget is around $650 million. And so um, the goal today is to educate you all on transportation funding, um, because one of the topics I've been talking about a lot recently is the state's plan to deploy electric vehicle charging infrastructure in support of the uh, electrification of the fleet. Um, but there is some concerns at uh, what that will mean for transportation funding and investment. And we all know that for not only a great quality of life, uh, but also for a thriving economy, we need a robust transportation network that meets everyone's needs. And to be able to sustain that network, we need funding. And so um, as we talk about electric vehicle charging infrastructure and the rate at which electric vehicles will be deployed in the state of New Hampshire in particular, um, that really does have to be in the context of you know, how are we going to be investing in our transportation system in the future. The so slides are going to keep flashing. I'm just going to keep talking. <laughs> so when we um, work with the legislature on the budget process, we try to split our budget into two uh, categories of funds. There's our true operating budget. We always color those parts of our pie charts orange uh, because our operating budget is really uh, the dollars that go to maintaining our infrastructure, those orange trucks that roll down the highway. And um, few people realize this. But we cannot use federal funding to maintain our roads and bridges. Um, federal funds can be used for rehabilitation, for replacement, and to build new infrastructure. But we can't use federal dollars to fund um, our routine work. So we cannot use federal dollars as an example to plow the roads. And so um, while we receive a lot of federal funding for infrastructure improvements, um, that's the orange part of the pie chart, or sorry, the blue part of the pie chart uh, primarily. That's the money that's going out to our construction programs. Um, oftentimes we're funding uh, projects at the municipal level as well. And it's the operating budget um, where we're most reliant on state funds. And so the slides I'm using today are the slides that we provided to the legislature during the last budget process. So we're currently working under the 22-23 budget. This was our presentations back in 21. We're going to be refreshing all of this information in January and February as we talk about the next budget uh, with the legislature in the new year. And so how are we funded? This is the mix of funds. Um, we are very reliant on federal funds as a state. And so the orange uh, portion um, is about equal to that blue portion. So federal funds, like I said, cannot be used for routine operations. Um, but we are using federal funds for public transit, for airports, and for all of our capital projects. And with the passage of the infrastructure law, um, as well as the passage of many of the COVID relief packages, we have more federal money today than we once had, but we still can't use it for our routine operations. Um, and then there's other limited uses of funds. Um, for example, our turnpike system. Uh, every dollar we collect on the turnpike can only be spent on the turnpike. It can't be spent anywhere else. There's a lot of rules and strings attached to the different colors of funding when it comes to um, their uses uh, based on the purpose of those funds. So why am I here lecturing you all on um, transportation funding? Well, really, our number one concern is the health of the state highway fund. Um, and one thing I should point out is the highway fund is not the DOT, and the DOT is not the highway fund. Um, I don't even collect the revenue. It's the Department of Safety that collects all of the revenue. Um, and what is the state funding uh, mechanism? Well, we have both vehicle registrations um, as well as some other fees. And then what we call in New Hampshire the road toll um, that flow into the highway fund. And the road toll is really our state gas tax. So not to be confused with toll roads like the turnpike, um, but the legislature recognizing that um, when you use the system, you should pay uh, to have access to that system. They do not refer to our state gas tax as a tax. They call it the road toll to infer that it's more of a user fee. And so um, it can be confusing at times that we use that terminology, but it does reflect that it's more of a user fee. So you can imagine as we talk about uh, now a faster pace at which vehicles will um, become more fuel efficient, um, 
we are very concerned about what that means both at the state level and the federal level in terms of our sources of revenue. Um, and so there's a lot of nuances to what happens in the, the highway fund. Actually, all of our federal money flows into it and comes back out to fund our projects. Uh, but the main source of revenue uh, for the state work is that road toll and then vehicle registrations. And it's not just the DOT that benefits from this money. If our revenues decline, 12% um, of what we collect comes off the top and goes back to cities and towns for them to fund their local projects. So as we think about all of this, it's not just gonna impact the capacity of the Department of Transportation because 12% of both the vehicle registrations and the road toll goes back to municipalities by law, um, it will impact them as well. And that's what we call the block grant, 12% goes back. Um, it does also impact our construction program. About a third of the roads in New Hampshire are not eligible for federal funds. Um, we have roads that are considered off system. They're not part of the national highway system. They're either unnumbered routes or local roads that the state DOT still owns. Um, we call them our tier three and four roads and we cannot use federal funds. And so we use um, what we call the betterment funds to maintain those roads. And so our state gas tax or road toll in New Hampshire is 22.2 cents. The 12% comes off the top of each of these categories. And so um, the betterment account is supposed to be three cents from that gas tax. It ends up being 2.6 cents because we take the 12% off the top. And so that's the money that's available for fixing those tier three and four roads that don't qualify for federal funds. Likewise, several years ago, there was a gas tax increase passed, 4.2 cents was passed <coughs> to fund um, specifically the widening of I-93. We have to pay back a loan for I-93. So as our revenues decline, the amount of money um, that we're collecting with that gas tax increase also goes down. And so we definitely um, can cover those loan payments, but we've been using those dollars for other things beyond just paying for the widening of I-93, which was the major project they wanted to complete with the 4.2 cents gas tax. And so our capacity to do those other things will be diminished. Um, and then, like I said, the rest, the remaining 12.8 cents is what we call the unrestricted portion um, that flows uh, into the highway fund and can be used for the routine operating budget. Um, and both the Department of Safety as well as DOT draw on the highway fund. You can imagine operating the highway doesn't mean just maintaining it, but also policing it. So we fund for a lot, a lot of the operations of um, state police as well. And then other agencies that support the work of DOT and Department of Safety also get to charge to the highway fund when they're working on our projects. And so this is all um, very difficult to read. This is the same slides we use when we talk to the legislature, but what I want you to look at is this trend line. Um, this is how highway fund revenue has been declining over time and why. Um, so it's not just about um, battery electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Um, every single vehicle on the road today is more fuel efficient. And so I use the example all the time. I used to drive an old Ford Explorer that got 12 miles per gallon. Um, if you buy even the most inefficient sort of mid-size SUV today, you're probably gonna get 24, 25 miles per gallon. So people are just paying less in road toll than they once were. And so the legislature, I will give them a tremendous amount of credit, has done a lot of things to ensure that we didn't end up having to uh, cut our services uh, within the DOT. And so there's been a number of different initiatives um, and one-time funding mechanisms that have been used to try and make sure that some of these gaps were closed. But the other thing that hit us hard was COVID. Um, when we had the stay-at-home order and then the safer-at-home order in place, um, of course, people stopped driving. And so this is the traffic volumes on I-93 um, in the year, I think it's 2020, when the pandemic hit, you can see all of a sudden people um, stopped driving. And so what we've been struggling with recently is now we have the greening of the fleet happening, which means vehicles are more fuel efficient, and then we still have residual changes in uh, driver behavior from the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, people are still teleworking more. So even if you just telework one day a week, that's a 20% reduction in your commuting miles. And so uh, we're trying to figure out um, which different factors are contributing to the changes in the revenue. Um, and then likewise now with fuel prices being very high, people think twice about taking some trips and so that also impacts the revenue projections. Um, so it's gonna be a challenging budget cycle. Um, like I said, the legislature has come through and stepped up many times. Uh, this is the chart that shows some of the one-time sources of revenue 
that were added either into the highway fund or used in our budget to make sure that we could maintain those critical services. The big spike is when COVID hit, um, we got a significant amount of relief funds from the federal government. We got 41 million that was specifically in the CRISA bill to be used for highway purposes to recognize that lost revenue during COVID. Um, but still, um, this trend line overall is the same trend line as the um, uh, highway fund revenue. And so you can see that we weren't always able to close those gaps entirely. And so what does all this mean? So this is the context. This is to um, explain why um, we're uh, concerned that we need to be having these conversations now around what is the appropriate way to fund transportation into the future. Um, this is a table that shows the number of electric vehicles currently registered in the state of New Hampshire. Um, the Division of Motor Vehicles has recently provided uh, updated information for 21 and for 22 year to date, so we'll be able to update these statistics. But we know that the number of vehicles is growing, especially in the southern part of the state. And then um, the automakers, you know, irrespective of cafe standards um, or uh, any other sort of incentives, they're making these very ambitious uh, commitments to move uh, their fleet to all electric within a pretty short period of time. And so these are some of the trends that we've been following closely, um, especially as we're thinking about the rate at which we need to deploy electric vehicle charging infrastructure. I'm um, you know, hearing that all the major automakers um, have these targets, whether it's 2025, 2030, 2035, to either be 100% um, battery electric or carbon zero. Uh, these are all the, the trends that are really going to um, incent not just incentivize, but lead to people ultimately driving these types of vehicles, um, whether or not they're inclined to do it today. And the market is just continuing to grow and grow. And so what are we doing at the Department of Transportation? Well, like I said earlier, I don't um, envy our elected officials. They have some very tough decisions to make when it comes to how we fund and pay for things. I sometimes think I have the easy job. Um, I make the pitch as to what we should be spending our money on. It's the uh, legislature that ultimately has to determine how best to fund things. And what have we been doing here in New Hampshire? Well, we've been doing what the federal government's been doing. Like I said, taking general funds and other sources of revenue and using them to fund transportation. Um, but what we're trying to do is working closely with our colleagues at um, the DMV um, and using consultant support when it's appropriate, try to forecast different scenarios. Um, again, this is very hard to see. Uh, these are our uh, stats that we used back in 2020 for the budget process, just forecasting what we might see under different scenarios for reduction in revenue um, in the road toll if folks are driving more fuel efficient vehicles. Um, we actually need to update these uh, these slides and this data now as we go into the next budget, because I think with the more aggressive targets coming from some of the automakers, the rate at which people will be purchasing these uh, electric vehicles and, and plug-in hybrids will be much, much higher. And so this data is probably stale. Um, so we had been forecasting sort of moderate adoption here in New Hampshire, uh, but if you look at you know a high market share of EVs in the short term, you're talking about potentially as much as a 30% reduction in revenue by 2030, which makes sense um, given what we're seeing uh, as industry trends from the automakers themselves. And so this is what we're doing at the Department of Transportation is trying to keep our ear to the ground, um, understand where the industry is heading so that we can help tell the story of what the impact will be financially for all of us who are trying to fund projects and get this work done and then work with policymakers to come up with solutions um, and the new model going forward. And so uh, this afternoon, we're supposed to be proposing uh, solutions. Um, what, what can I tell you about the alternatives to the road toll? Well, a number of state DOTs have been uh, piloting um, different initiatives, uh, one of which is um, to start using vehicle miles traveled um, as a way of um, tracking usage of the system and then have a, a corresponding uh, charge uh, to ensure that we're collecting revenue. Um, at different times, as we've talked about electric vehicle charging, um, some folks have thought perhaps we can just meter uh, the charging itself and have some kind of fee associated with um, actually powering your vehicle. Um, members of the legislature have even gone so far as to suggest that you know if you're doing home charging, we might need to have second meters on your house. Um, to be able to separate your power usage, you know, what were you using for transportation related charging versus your regular um, household use. Um, 
there's a lot going on in the industry right now, and it's really hard to forecast where things are going to end up. Um, but it is more likely than not that uh, VMT will prevail just because um, it's the only way of truly assessing use of the system. Um, like I said, here in New Hampshire, we call it a road toll because it's considered um, a usage fee uh, based on your use of the system. And um, here in New Hampshire, our legislature has been grappling with this for several sessions now. Um, Representative Norm Major had actually put forward uh, some legislation um, around a road usage fee that would have been a registration surcharge, basically, to try and close the gap. Um, not increasing tax or fees, uh, but a registration charge that would be proportional to how fuel efficient your vehicle was, trying to get back to the same, you know, make sure that everybody was contributing what they were contributing previously. Um, that, though, uh, was not necessarily um, as well thought out when it was first proposed. We've gone through several iterations uh, with uh, Representative Major. Um, but some of these industry changes have rightly so caused the legislature to pause. Um, and so we now have a study committee that's going to be formed to look at this issue much more closely. Previously, when this issue has been discussed in the legislature, you know, those who really thought that we needed to encourage folks to drive more fuel efficient vehicles, they were hesitant to propose solutions. Um, while there's others in the legislature that felt very strongly that everyone's using the system, everybody needs to pay their fair share. So we've had these competing sort of um, thoughts around where we should um, be at in terms of uh, incentivizing versus ensuring equity. But um, I think we're going to pass a point where uh, we just need to migrate to a new solution. And so the last thing I would say is I do have, again, empathy for our legislature here in New Hampshire. Uh, we have a federal gas tax, 18 cents, that is collected. And so many people do believe that we should wait to see what the federal government does. Um, why would we implement a new solution here in New Hampshire with you know, potentially a cost of collections? Um, that then might be at odds with whatever the federal solution is. And so that's the other thing um, I'll just say in closing is not only are we at DOT trying to support the legislature as they grapple with these really big things, um, we too are trying to follow what's happening at the federal level um, because, of course, we want the two systems to work um, in a way that's complementary and keep the cost of collections as low as possible so that every dollar that we're collecting can go out into the infrastructure and the operations of the systems. Um, and so it's, it's not an easy task uh, for our elected officials in the years ahead, whether it's at the federal level or the state level. Um, but it's really important for everybody in this community to understand that you know, we do need, as I said earlier, good roads and bridges. And so we can't just think about the, the technical challenges that we face as we electrify the fleet. We have to think about the financial impacts as well. So happy to take some questions in a little bit. Don't know who I'm passing. <laughs> Are the slides stacked together? Are we okay? Technical magic happens here. It doesn't involve the, the uh, projector starting to flicker again. I'm just riffing on the uh, technical problems we have, so you haven't missed too much yet. Um, All right, so I, I understand there may be some, uh, some free market fans in the room. So we're gonna talk about an opportunity to do some um, home efficiency from a free market perspective. See what uh, the federal government has offered us here. So I'm just gonna start out with a caveat. This is talking about the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I have not read the whole thing. I'm not a, a you know, legislature geek, what I am is a uh, an energy savings measurement geek, and so you'll you'll see that come out as we as we go through the talk. I've been working in um, data analytics for measuring and valuing energy savings in the efficiency space and demand flexibility space. Um, not for that entire 20-year career, but for the last you know 10, 12 years of it. Um, so, and and not to scare you off from actually reading the language. There's not actually that many pages of uh, of this act that are focused on the specific part that I'm talking about here. So um, frankly, though, the details are going to get hashed out in the end of this year by the DOE. So that the text doesn't have that much detail. What it does have is some very important things. $4.3 billion is the first important detail. So there's a bunch of funding going in here to help weatherize and 
make homes more efficient. These are whole home programs, right? This is gonna look very similar to what we've seen with Home Performance with Energy Star and programs like that, which look at envelope and HVAC, heating and cooling, and sort of the whole, the whole business, right? Anything you can do to lower a home's energy bills um, is theoretically part of this. And it's administered through the states, right? So this is the other really important part. This is the policy pitch part of this, is that the federal government is not gonna write checks. Um, in many cases, the state government may not write checks either. It may delegate to some um, agency or organization or the utilities or efficiency program or something like that, right? I'm sure there's room in there to, to delegate. But ultimately, the state energy department is the one that's got to request the money. That's the emphasis here. Um, so there's the language in the act. Uh, you got to put, you got to submit a plan. So here's a little more details about what are in the language so far, what we know about how these rebates will work. Um, there is uh, a scaled amount of incentive per project. It depends on a couple things. It depends on how much savings the project has, and there's also a double savings for uh, low income customers. I think it's 80% of median. Um, and there's also a bonus for homes in disadvantaged communities. Uh, I want to clarify too, there's a, there's a comment in here that it can be stacked with other incentive programs, meaning that you can get this incentive and you can get other incentives for the same project, right? So this can increase the value of other types of incentives. That's not true about the other incentives in this federal act. <laughs> there's a bunch of other rebates in here for heat pumps and other things that um, you might go into these projects. You can't double up on the federal dollars, but there's a lot of state dollars. I heard there's a rumor that maybe New Hampshire has a whole home efficiency program again. So that would provide an opportunity to uh, double up on the funding and make it even more attractive for customers, even more valuable. Um, and there's also some other opportunities in here that may or may not have to come into every single program. When we talk about the uh, valuation of savings based on time, location, and greenhouse gases. Um, that's looking at things like um, you know, are there places on the grid where there's more value or, so how do we create a policy that actually sends the right signal out to the market? If we're gonna do market-based savings, then you wanna set the right signals out so people do the things that are valuable, right? That's why we have policies. Um, here's an example, and the Recurve logo up on there is given props to, to Recurve. They've done some of the, the work to sort of take the language in the bill and then run some calculations to make it easy to see. Because there are some aspects of this bill that are specific to an individual state, they scale with uh, population and energy costs and things like that. Understanding what the opportunity is for a particular state, like New Hampshire, um, means understanding how those calculations work out. So that number at the top is the first important one, $37 million. That's the amount that's estimated to be uh, available to New Hampshire if it were to apply for this. One really important caveat in here is that number can change, it can go up. Not every state may apply for these. If some states don't apply and there are unallocated dollars, all the states that have put in applications and have programs will get a piece of the unallocated dollars. So use it or lose it. Send it to someone else. We'll take it in Vermont. Um, <laughs> no, I want you to use it, really. Um, here's the other piece. The incentives are also scaled to, um, and this is particularly for the, the measured track we'll get into in a minute but they're also scaled to the cost of energy in that state. So uh, the cost of energy go up, that also means that the value of the incentives goes up. I don't know how this will be adjusted over time. This is one of the other details that's not spelled out in the bill. We'll see what the DOE puts out for it, uh, but it definitely matters. Here's a, a distribution. I'm not expecting you to read all the little letters down there. I conveniently circled the New Hampshire's on here. Here are the costs per unit of energy savings. Um, so New Hampshire's on the higher end of things because, lamentably, costs of energy are a little bit higher in this state. This whole graph is a little skewed because Hawaii is an island. Uh, and also, California and Florida have their own issues. So, um, so that's, you know, it's, that's nice, that's fair, that's good for you. Here's the part that um, distinguishes how these savings uh, are valued, how the payment is going to be calculated. So the payments get paid out either to individuals or to aggregators. We'll talk about that in a minute. But there's two paths, and you gotta pick one, right? You saw earlier maybe the state needs to file a plan to explain how they're gonna do it. This has gotta be in the plan. Which path are you gonna take, right? So there's two choices. Modeled savings, you use some type of energy modeling software. You input 
how much insulation are you putting in and what is the efficiency of the heating system that you're putting in versus the old one and you put in all these numbers into some big modeling tool and it cranks a bunch of physics calculations and it comes out and says i think this is going to save whatever over the next years um and then and then we all we all trust it because models are perfect <laughs> um, they do have to be like certified models right you can't just be a homebrew excel sheet metered savings is the other option right so it requires you to use open source weather normalized billing data analysis open ee meter is the open source software that does this um, came out of a, a collaborative process in the industry where a bunch of geeks got together and figured out how to make a standard repeatable process for calculating energy savings weather normalized just means that you know some years if you have a really harsh winter you may save more over the winter because you had more load over the winter but that doesn't affect the savings right we do it against a, a typical year if the year before was harsh and the year after was mild, right, that can mess with your savings too. That stuff all gets smoothed out by this and it says just what was the impact of the project, not the impact of changes in weather. So as you weigh this choice, as you prepare your plan, and surely you will, um, you can look at the pros and cons of the, of the two paths. Absolutely no bias here as I present to you how model savings typically um, has lower outcomes than what is anticipated. Uh, oftentimes what we see, I mean, this is the way we've been doing programs for years and years and years. Someone goes out in the field and they say, ah, your old walls are probably pretty crummy and your old heater seems like it's 20 years old, it's got some rust on it, I bet it's terrible, and I'm going to do a fantastic job when I weatherize your home and I bet you're going to save 50%. Count on it. Plug all those numbers in. No one actually drills holes in your walls and brings out testing equipment for all the, you know, uh, you know blowers and whatnot. There is some testing, but it is not ever detailed enough not surprisingly, what we've seen over time, state by state by state, is that the savings end up being overestimated. And when we come back later and we look at the billing reduction, we see less savings than customers were promised. So sad for the program, sadder for the customers. And the contractors have all the inclination in the world to try to get the project sold, right? No fault on the contractors. This is what you're told. You want to get money? Plug in numbers that get you over this line and prove that you're going to save energy. What do they do? You know, if you're gonna err, you're, it's uh, self-interest, uh, unfortunately, is part of that equation. High admin costs, because now we gotta chase after all the contractors and be like, show me your numbers. I gotta make sure you're not cheating. All right, I'm at another rule. You've gotta use this product and that product, right? So we're always sort of chasing after the truth on this one. The metered savings advantage is we don't tell the contractors what they need to do. This is the market part of it, right? If one contractor says, I'm gonna put fairy dust in your walls, there's Actually, I should, I should use a real example because there's a crazier example out there. Someone was selling paint. For those of you that are geeky enough to know our values off, off the top of your head, they said it was an R30 paint. You paint this paint on the outside of your house, you don't even need to put insulation in. Um, the second chapter of the story is where the president of the company had to come back and put a larger HVAC system into his house because he didn't put insulation in the walls of his new house, just his paint, and he couldn't keep up with the cooling costs because guess what? It doesn't work. So. If you think it works, go do it, fine. And then we'll check afterwards. And if your magic paint saves all that much energy, you'll get paid for it. If it doesn't, that's your problem, right? So we'll get into the aggregator model too, right? In, in my opinion, uh, the metered savings should not be on the customer, right? The idea is not, hey, you believed me. And if I'm right, you'll get double the savings. And if I'm wrong, not only do your bills not go down, eh, you get no incentive either, right? The double or nothing proposition for customers is not what we're trying to push here. This is trying to get the incentives aligned from the folks who are running the programs, who have all the geeks making the models and deciding where to put their money and going out there and QCing the project and making sure they get done right, making sure their incentives are aligned. They get paid when they do it right and not if they do it wrong. And we don't have to tell them how to do it. We just tell them, this is what we care about, lowering energy bills, very simple. So it can go on top of the existing programs. You wanna put in equipment that has a state rebate, Fine, go ahead, that's great. Um, and it allows that innovation. So let's talk about this aggregator model a little bit, because this always sounds a little bit weird. What does this mean? So here in general terms is what it means, right? So this, this icon up here of a single contractor, typically aggregators aren't like some small one truck contractor that does you know 10 or 20 projects a year. It could be some large contractor that's doing hundreds of projects. It can also be sort of a, a program that's operating independently, right? So they're marketing, they're setting the structure for what kind of incentives are they gonna give to customers, right? Because the idea of passing these rebates onto the aggregator is that then they can compete on lowering the cost to the customer, right? 
And so they decide how much to discount the project on the assumption that they're going to do such an awesome job that they're going to get a check in the mail. So they go and sell these projects, install them in a bunch of homes. We measure the savings using actual data. Where do we get the data, you say? Stay tuned. This generic utility could be a gas utility. I realize we don't use those towers for gas. Um, but it, it counts on both sides. It's important, right? So if you do fuel switching, you, so you net out the costs. And then the um, aggregator gets paid, right? And so, yeah, there's some weirdness in how stuff gets measured. And this house got to got a, you know, put it in a swimming pool. And, and you know, that house, the kid moved out to college. On average, the impact is what happened from your projects, right? We take out the weather, variation in the groups. So that's why we need a large enough group to aggregate, right? We don't try to do this on an individual project basis. We do it in the aggregate. I just want to pause for a second as we talk about the platform to appreciate. I don't know if anyone else has tried the designer mode in PowerPoint. They now have a little AI that sits in PowerPoint and has apparently watched 10 million business presentations online and has figured out all the cheesy crap we like to put in our PowerPoints and does it for you automatically. And so when, when I hit designer on this one, just for fun, the New Hampshire Energy Data Platform, it apparently thinks is a bunch of cables plugged into the back of a router, <laughs> which just cracked me up. So I love that. Uh, I, I, I let the robot do this for me. Good job, robot, sort of. Um, so the history of this, there was a bill, then there was a regulatory proceeding, and then it passed. We all agreed. This is, and, and disclosure, I've been part of this thing for the last year and some. Some others in this room may have been part of it as well. Thank you all. Um, so now we got a consensus settlement. The utilities and all the customer advocates and everyone in the room came up with a plan that we all agreed could work. Now we're doing it. We're designing it and figuring it all out. It is a statewide multi-use energy data platform, meaning gas, electric, someday other kinds of energy. We want to have a unified platform. All the people who can use energy data can find it in one place, and it will all be in standard form. We don't have to figure out 19 different ways to go and find data, and who do I have to talk to, and what format is it in, and where do I go fill out a form? So we got the, the big IOUs, Eversource Unit to Liberty. We're using federal standards. There's government standards. Green button is a format that already exists. Lots of people use it. We're building on top of that. And this is the third party piece, right? Third parties are someone who is not the customer, the customer grants permission to that third party, and then they can get the data. So it's going to sound very similar to the aggregators in the previous slide. Um, this could be, again, no bias about which path you want to take for measured or modeled. Even the modeled savings is supposed to be calibrated against past energy bills. So even if you were to make the poorly informed decision to go with the measured savings, the modeled savings rather, uh, you could use this to calibrate them. So what does the platform look like? It doesn't look like a cloud either. Uh, I also want to say, again, again, the, the, the comedy of PowerPoint, I, I put data in the icon search. Oh, good. OK. Yeah. <laughs> the robots heard me, and I'm getting payback now. <laughs> <laughs> so quick, while it's up. That's what data gets you in the icon search. <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely loaded the slides off my floppy today. Um, so the, the aggregator makes a request to the homeowner or the bill payer, whoever has the, the responsibility, says, would you please share your data with me? It's probably going to be a requirement of, the, of participating. The um, bill owner grants the authorization. And they can grant that for one time, or they can grant it into the future. right? So you can say, you can have it for the next year, as you need to continue measuring that project. So you grant the authorization, and then the aggregator can request data continuously and find out, are my projects working? And if you're not getting the results that you thought you're going to get, and you realize you're not getting the payments you thought you're going to get, you're going to start doing things differently to make sure that customers are getting more savings. So what's next on all this? Um, we're working on the data platform. It takes a while. We've got a lot of geeks working on this stuff. Um, there's a governance council. So there's 11 folks representing various different interests. I represent Clean Energy New Hampshire on the governance council. We all put our heads together and we say, no, that's the feature we need. No, that's not the right way to get there. We agree. We move forward. The PUC keeps an eye on us and makes sure that we're keeping things on track and moving forward. Um, and in terms of this rebate program, we have uh, some steps that hopefully you will take next, which are to develop the plan, make the request to the feds, get your $37 million, and go create a market. Oh, but let me also just say, there, there are some other things that I think could be really useful, right? This, this automated process for measuring savings, it's open source software. 
Open source software is a library. It's not something that you load up and sit down and it just magically does everything, right? So creating some kind of a state resource to make it easier for all the different contractors to access that could save across the whole state. And then there's training, there's information, right? We gotta help get the, the industry is not used to doing this stuff today, right? We've trained them how to fill out forms for decades. They don't know how to actually use this type of data analysis. So we need to help get the industry ready too. All right, N not questions now, questions at the end, right? Thank you. No, I have some slides. They're not in there? Okay, while Chris is trying to find my slides, let me just say what an honor it is as the state's consumer advocate to be in such a distinguished panel as this one. Uh, you know, uh, Ethan Goldman, uh, he was telling you about the data platform. That platform is gonna succeed, and when it does, it's gonna be Ethan who des deserves the credit. That are, th those are my slides. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Bob is a pillar of the you know, world of renewable energy and energy progress in New Hampshire. And I'm so excited to be up here with uh, Commissioner Sheehan, because I've been a fan of hers for a really long time. And we, she and I have two important things in common that I want to make sure you know. One I just discovered, which is we both have a thing about electric utility rate design. So we got some stuff to talk about. The other thing I want to highlight is that something that she and I have in common is that we both were appointed to our jobs by the previous governor. Now, some of you will remember that the previous governor was in a different political party than the current governor is. Both of us have been reappointed by the current governor. Now, I, I don't know if this is a point of pride with Commissioner Sheehan, but I am the only person ever to hold my job who has been nominated by a governor from each of the two major parties. And I am so proud of that. Okay, so my policy pitch concerns least cost integrated resource planning, which is a statute. So you know when you know, you're a hammer, the world is a nail. Well, I'm a lawyer, that's the kind of hammer I am. So the world is a nail, meaning the statutes of this great state are my nail. And so here is a statute that I wanna fix. And I have a very long and tortured history with this particular statute because I used to be the general counsel of the PUC. So back in like 2007 or so, some cockamamie legislator put in some bill to tinker with this statute, and I had to go over to the House Science, Tech, and Energy Committee and tell them why to get rid of this bill. And in the course of doing that, I happened to make a, the following casual remark. I referred to this statute, which dates from 1991, as a, quote, dinosaur. So the hearing comes to an end and everybody kind of gets up to leave and I'm shuffling out. And Amanda Merrill, former state senator, Amanda Merrill, some of you may know her, walks up to me and says, Don, I wrote that statute. Who are you calling a dinosaur? <laughs> that is why least cost integrated resource planning got my attention. Why did Senator Merrill write the statute? Well, it dates back, the reason I was calling it a dinosaur is that it dates from the era before electric industry restructuring, before we busted up the vertically integrated electric utilities. Why did we need a statute like this? Because back in the old days, uh, it was way, way, way too easy for an electric utility to be able to justify whatever the next toy was that they wanted to invest in. You know, there was no requirement of like, look at your system holistically, right? You could just say, here's the next big toy I wanna buy. We have to do it, PUC, you can't stop us from doing this. Pretty soon you have spent $7 billion building Seabrook. So. The idea was, oh, now we are going to require our utilities to not just build whatever they want, not gold plate their system, but they have to create a plan and file it with the PUC. Well, what is supposed to be in a least cost integrated resource plan? Well, we have a little thing called the official state energy policy. It's in RSA 37837. And you know, here it is in a nutshell. You can't just submit a plan. You have to tell the PUC and the PUC has to bless your plan about how you're gonna deploy your resources so as to do accomplish all of these somewhat competing policy imperatives, right? And in addition to doing all of these things, your plan 
government has to, and this, this is kind of a no-brainer, uh, make sure that you stay financially stable. Because one thing we've learned in New Hampshire is that a bankrupt utility is bad for shareholders and customers. So we don't want the utilities to go bankrupt. We want them to achieve a bunch of policy objectives. And we want to do it at the lowest reasonable cost. And... So you submit your plan every three, uh, two to five years to the PUC. The PUC has to review it and approve it. And guess what? This is a statute with, unlike my daughter, teeth. <laughs> this is, uh, that's an old picture of Rose. She's now in college. She has teeth again. Uh, the teeth in the LCIRP statute are that unless you have on file with the PUC a least cost integrated resource plan that has been approved, guess what? You may not increase your rates. Spoiler alert, utilities like to increase their rates. Ergo, they need to, you know, do their least cost integrated resource plan, get it approved. But there is a loophole in that statute, 37840. It says that if you have filed a plan and it is under review by the PUC, quote, in the ordinary course, then yes, you can increase your rates. That's a very compelling loophole. So I, I make the following observation with considerable reluctance because my job as consumer advocate is to romance the Public Utilities Commission and you do not win friends among your regulators when you accuse them of what I am about to accuse the PUC of, which is to say that since forever, the Public Utilities Commission has been grievously misinterpreting and misapplying this statute through two distinct eras of the PUC. Back when Marty Honigberg was the chairman of the PUC, the PUC was telling the utilities, oh, we're not going to look at the actual decisions that you're making, you know, how you're choosing among all the different options available to you. We are just going to review how you make your planning decisions. Well, th that might be a useful thing for the regulator to think about, but that's not what the LCIRP statute tells the agency to do. It was driving me crazy. So, eventually, Marty Honigberg became a judge, and now we have Dan Goldner as the chair of the PUC, and now the PUC has figured out that actually the LCIRP statute does require the PUC to look at the actual options that each utility is choosing, each natural gas and electric utility. And note the statute says options, meaning it's not just about deploying capital, it's about what different choices you can make. Some of them don't involve deploying capital. What if, for example, you can avoid rebuilding a whole substation and making it beefier and bigger just by getting everybody served by that substation to agree to maybe power back a little of their electric usage, you know, at four or five in the afternoon on a few select days in July and August when demand is super high and thereby allow the utility to avoid investing 10 or 20 million bucks in, you know, completely rebuilding a substation. What a great idea. That uh, non-wires alternative, as they say in the trade, is not a capital expenditure necessarily, but it is an option. And all of those options are supposed to be in these least cost integrated resource plans. And they are supposed to convince the PUC that that assemblage of options is least cost, least cost to customers. And lest I fail to remind you, here is the only wallet in the room. At the end of the day, the utilities are made whole, and it's the ratepayers who pay for everything. Everything. So, unfortunately, the current Public Utilities Commission, although it has finally figured out that it must review options in the utility LCIRPs, thinks that the LCIRP statute has a one-line text that says, tell us how you plan to provide safe and reliable service as cheaply as possible period. Well, as I, you saw in my initial slide, that is not what the statute says. It's driving me crazy. Okay. Now, as I said, I was calling the LCIRP statute a dinosaur because it predates restructuring. And so what the electric utilities have said to the PUC over the years, and I think this accounts for why the old PUC said, well, just tell us how you plan. The electric utilities point out that we, you made us sell off all our generation assets. 
All we do now when we need electricity to resell to our customers uh, as default services, we just put out an RFP every six months for load following service. We pick the low bidder and we set the price. Well, don't we all know how that is working out these days, right? But that's what the, the electric utilities say. Well, all that supply, you know, we used to own Seabrook and Merrimack Station and, you know, all these other things. Now we don't own any of that, so we don't have to take that into account in our LCIRPs. And they also say, by the way, oh, we don't have to investigate whether we need to invest any more resources in energy efficiency. We just check the box because we're taking ratepayer money via the system benefits charge and spending that on NH saves. So we don't have to consider whether there's any more energy efficiency we could buy that would actually be least cost in comparison to supply side options. And then our two gas utilities say, Oh, well, you can't make a gas utility to uh, do anything but sell stuff that comes through our pipelines. You can't tell us to, like, uh, convert our natural gas customers to using heat pumps. That's electricity. We're a gas utility. So that's what I hear when I talk to the utilities about least cost integrated resource planning. So when you take all of that into consideration, this fiasco that I just described... <laughs> of this uh, about this dinosaur of a statute i think it is time to rewrite not repeal the least cost integrated resource statute here is what i would like to see i would like to clarify that the statute is about how a utility deploys all available options whether they're capital projects whether they're other kinds of initiatives whether they're on the demand side or the supply side whatever it all has to be in there if it's plausible you must consider it utilities two i think it is high time that we democratize the process of developing these lease cost plans and the carrot that i want to offer the utilities is in exchange for letting people like me into the room and other stakeholders we will give you some insulation from prudence disallowances right because if i have helped you plan your future then i can't come back at you later and say well you did that that was imprudent because i helped tell you to do that right it only makes sense so there's the carrot that i'm offering the utilities i want to make sure the utilities understand that they have to consider every available demand side option not just those funded by ratepayers via the system benefits charge or its natural gas counterpart the ldac charge why do I say that? Because guess what, folks? Everybody in this room, I suspect, knows that in February, the legislature passed and the governor signed into law House Bill 549. House Bill 549 limits the amount of money we can collect via the system benefits and LDAC charges uh, for ratepayer-funded energy efficiency deployed via the NH Saves programs. Well, okay, you did that, legislature, but the LCIRP statute is still there, which means there could be even more energy efficiency that the utilities could use their own resources to explore. Imagine that. The LCIRP statute should tell them to. Why? Because the PUC has issued a bunch of orders in the last few weeks saying, uh-uh, we're not going to do that. Guess what? They're wrong. The LCIRP statute needs to make clear, it says this, I think, in there already, but the PUC has refused to interpret it this way, that the externalities really do count, that when you assess the health and environmental impacts, which they're required to do, it's not just like the health and environmental impacts of the fact that you have poles and wires and pipelines, and sometimes gas leaks out of the pipelines, and sometimes your lineman gets zapped or whatever. It's not just about that stuff, it's everything else, right? Like, if your customer are using a ton of natural gas in order to heat their homes or power their industrial processes and that itself is causing a lot of air pollution well you have to take that into account i'm not saying you can't do it i'm just saying that for purposes of your planning least cost planning you have to take that into account there is no there should be no get out of jail free card just because you don't own any generation anymore you still need to take the implications or impacts of and the costs god forbid of your default energy service portfolio into account as you do lease cost planning and finally with respect to uh the actual outcomes that we want i mean you know we we forget all the time that what we really all want out of this system is peace prosperity 
and you know happiness right a good life so that we can raise our families enjoy our retirements we don't want energy we want the work the energy does so that's what the lcirp statute fo should focus on how are you going to help customers get the work done that they need energy to get done on a least cost basis so that is my modest proposal for reforming the least cost integrated resource statute take that dinosaur and turn it into a red-tailed hawk thank you Are there any questions out there? Don. Uh, thanks, I enjoyed all of this. Um, I have a question for you, external costs. Um, so I'm convinced, Sam's not, but I'm convinced there will be a price of around $135 per ton of CO2 um, carbon emissions by 2030. Um, and the external costs, um, when they are reflected in the price of energy, are going to make some of our current decisions turn out to be bad decisions uh, if we're just using current market pricing. Um, what are your thoughts? I, I believe Colorado does something called proxy carbon pricing. They anticipate a price, they use a social cost of carbon, I think it's around $40 right now. But they, they build that into their calculation for the POC on energy projects. Um, is there any potential for doing something like that in New Hampshire so that we can? Anticipate, and I'll take this bet with anybody, that we will have a price of carbon at the federal level. Um, but we should be anticipating this. Don, <sighs> can you repeat the question? It's hard to hear from back here. Okay. So the question was that given that there is a future in which there will be a price on carbon, basically shouldn't, as part of least cost integrated resource planning, shouldn't our, we expect our utilities to take that cost into account as they plan their futures? And I guess, uh, uh, I, I guess I am not as sanguine as you are uh, about that happening in the future. Uh, and, and I noticed that I, I'm a big fan of uh, Dave Roberts, Dr. Volz, and I heard him say something uh, similar to that the other day. And, uh, you know, he's all about pragmatic solutions. I, I will say that, you know, we are applying assumptions about the social cost of carbon to our cost benefit testing for energy efficiency measures. So that the avoided social costs of carbon uh, are accounted for when we decide whether energy efficiency measures are worthy of ratepayer funding. In the broader context of utility planning, like I, I, until I get just the, until I convince the PUC that it should take any of that stuff into account, uh, I, I don't even get to the point where I am wondering like how do we account for uh, the impacts of carbon as utilities do their planning. I mean, you know, wh so if the question is how possible is that, I mean, that's a political question and I am not a partisan actor. There's an election coming up, vote. Mr. Uh, John, one of your slides said something about um, one of your bullet points, uh, uh, some measure of insulation against prudency in it. Uh, in exchange for, I forget how you phrase it, but uh, democratization. democratization or getting a peek behind the Iron Curtain or however you want to phrase it. What, what, are, what are your details on that? Like how embedded in the utilities planning processes would you propose outside stakeholders? That, um, my friend Rick LeBrec, a former employee of one of our major utilities, asks a very perceptive question. And it's a tricky one because uh, I, I'm not a utility. I don't know how to run Eversource or Liberty or Unitil. I don't want to pretend to. Uh, you know, I, I mean, the whole premise here is that we rely on their capital and their savvy in running electric or natural gas distribution systems. And I don't want to try to substitute my judgment for theirs. I just want to be in the room where it happens so I can inject my policy priorities into that. In an ideal world, there would be uh, of engineering assistance available to me independently 
independent of the utility, so we could question a lot of the assumptions that the utility are making. Uh, one of my problems with the PUC right now is that they don't get the distinction between regulating and managing a utility. Like th they want to micromanage our investor owned utilities in every respect, especially in energy efficiency and everything else. I think that's a really bad idea. So much as I don't want the PUC to do that, I don't want to do it either. I want to complain about what the utilities do. I don't want to do it. Henry. So this is a question for Ethan and Don. Oh, I really did enjoy the Department of Transportation presentation. I found that very important. Um, so I try to like, reconcile these two things, like these cost of resource planning for utilities and then market-based uh, energy reduction. Right, energy savings. So what if the least cost thing is we build the data platform, we get aggregators out of the marketplace, um, we get funding for the state, we can go in, we can deploy these aggregated, efficient, measured energy efficiency reductions. What if that's the lowest cost thing? How does that reconcile with the least cost of resource planning? Are these two things separate or are they? So, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a crack and I'll, I'll stand up so everyone can see me on this side. Um, I think the $37 million, although it sounds like a lot if it fell into your bank account, isn't like a lifetime supply of energy efficiency funding for the state, right? I mean, what we're looking for from these kind of fundings is a market transformation, right? Something that seeds a continuing effort. And so, you know, your, your question is perfect, right? If the utilities get value from customers reducing load in strategic ways, this is the time and location piece of it, right? Really, we should have, um, all your meters measure at the hourly basis, right? You've, you've all done that a long time. No? no, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Okay, so once you have hourly meters and you've got all this information so you can actually do your real least cost planning at a time and locational basis, then the utility should be spending its money on the resources that deliver the good, right? The cold beer and the hot showers that Don pointed out, right? Not the electrons that are flowing, right? We get the energy services by investing in the things that keep the system functioning. So, so utility rate basis efficiency? Sounds good to me. You said it. I, I think that's what sort of the metered energy efficiency kind of thing is. Uh, and I guess I agree with Ethan. I, I want to hijack this for a second. I want to ask Commissioner Sheehan a question. Uh, hey, so, I'm Okay, so here's my question. I, I am a big fan of electric vehicles as a grid resource, right? Like in my fantasy world, uh, electric vehicle and vehicles and their batteries aren't really transportation resources. They're actually uh, time of use arbitrage opportunities, right? Where we create time. <laughs> You know, you, you, you plug your car into the grid, you have a time of use rate, you use your car to drive around, but you also use it to suck energy out of the grid when it's cheap and maybe feed it back into the grid when it's necessary. How do we square that with what you seem to be thinking about, which is how do we get electric vehicles, how do we pay for the roads via their electric rates? I have to say, I, I, j just to be clear, I, I take a really jaundiced view of people who want to stuff things into electric rates that don't actually relate to electricity. Sorry to ask a hostile question. So but. I, I think the last couple of statements have uh, given us a little bit of a view of the future where we look at the prosumer model of energy, mm. where energy through the utility is monetized in either direction so that there's a successful flow from every storage resource to every load situation. These things are in the future. I just spent a week out at NREL. That's what everybody talks about out there, is this prosumer model. But it includes grid mod, it includes time of use, it includes storage, it includes all the dockets that the PUC has lost that exist. So next question, please. I got one right here. Well. <laughs> so, let me answer. Um, so, just so, just so we're clear, I did not advocate for any particular solution. I empathize that our legislature have to figure this out. Um, the one thing I will say is I've, I'm very fortunate. I've had a chance to participate in a number of what we call scanning tours, going to other countries that are further along when it comes to EV preparedness. Um, many of those countries are talking about the concepts that you just mentioned, that um, I'll charge my vehicle perhaps at home at night when uh, there's less demand on the system. I drive my vehicle to a campus where I work all day, 
That campus could even draw energy out of my battery to fuel that campus and then push enough power back into my vehicle for me to drive home at night. That is one potential um, solution in terms of how we balance our use of the grid. But my point today was that we can't just deal with, you know, we are in the, the thick of things when it comes to electric vehicle infrastructure deployment right now. How are we going to work with the utilities? How do we best utilize these dollars? Where do we need charging infrastructure? But the piece that we don't want to overlook is we have a current model and a way to pay for our infrastructure today. Immediately people think about what they know, right? So when they think, okay, I go to a gas pump today, I pay a gas tax, that makes sense. Okay, maybe when I charge, there should be some fee or something on, you know, because that's what they know today. It's harder to visualize a new normal. And so this is what we're grappling with. Um, and not knowing exactly what the, the overall use of these vehicles will be, um, and especially as we start to layer on top of that connected and automated vehicles, and perhaps the fact that I don't own a vehicle, I own a service and a vehicle comes when I need it. You know, how are we charging those vehicles? It's a completely different model into the future. And so it's an exciting time to work in transportation, but it's a daunting time because we don't know the rate at which this change is actually going to occur. And then how we pay for the infrastructure improvements to even make it occur is a, a big question mark right now because things are in flux. And so we have an opportunity to do things very differently in the future, but that pace of change um, is what is the most uncertain aspect at the moment. Awesome answer. <laughs> now, we do have a question here. Mm. Yeah, Mike. Um, the question is for you. You said about the, um, using the internet of things to prevent our efficiencies. Could you explain if this has any impact on the quality of where the energy is coming from? If it's utility is using fast gas versus a community power and their ability to provide data and the efficiencies that you're getting, is there any type of dy dynamic involved with that? Yeah, so maybe maybe a couple questions packed in there. So I think the, the first half talking about, uh, you mentioned the Internet of Things data being part of this measurement. Um, I, I'm a, an enthusiast of using that data in the future. I think it's probably a little premature at this point, and it, it brings in a lot of complications. I know the pilot that the Energy Co-op of New Hampshire is doing is looking at measuring impact at an individual device level. Um, I think that's a little challenging. I guess there's another side of it that could be we could improve the models if we had this, right? So for example, EVs aren't weather dependent. They really mess up the models. If we had data from the EV charger, we could make a model that more clearly represented what is the energy savings independent of someone's, you know, patterns of driving their EV or something like that. So I think there's, there's one set of challenges in there. I think the, the other half of your question was about how the um, externalities in the energy mix at different times, potentially locations, but mostly different times, um, would be reflected back in that. And so I think the, uh, the language in the IRA allows for time and location to be integrated in the plan. So if the, um, you know, I guess sort of following Don's recommendation about building that into the planning, we could also build it into the, the valuation and the rates and so the payment that we've been making back out to the aggregators would be higher at times where we are reducing energy that we feel has a higher social cost and they'd get less payment at a time. So for example, you look at California, right? They are times where they're curtailing solar load. You're not saving anything when you're curtailing solar load other than saving the grid from collapsing, right? So why would you pay efficiency to reduce the demand to save nothing, right? On the other hand, there's times of day when there's really expensive energy and we should be paying a lot for that time. So I think there's the direct financial cost of energy, but we could also layer in externalities as part of the equation. You know, even if it's not in the retail rates, we could at least start layering in, into the aggregator compensation rates and give them a higher rate for fixing a home in a way that uh, saves emissions. Oh, okay. So, so fair question. Um, the way that this is anticipated currently in its in its uh, structuring is it uses the data from the utility meters only. That's all that's necessary. And unless we bring in the time and locational aspect of it, we don't even need hourly meters. So we're not even restricted to the portion of the state that has um, hourly meters. So. Uh, 
if you can get monthly data through the platform for any customer, gas or electric, um, the only one, the one messy caveat is the unregulated delivered fuels, oil and propane. That's really, really hard. I don't have a solution for that except bring them into the regulatory space. But um, no, as it stands right now, the platform should really be a, a leveling uh, effect, right? So anyone should be able to get that data with minimal costs. Any more? Um, your, uh, further conversation on, on the world of uh, EVs and uh, how they pay for road work. Uh, I just want to way back, I had the privilege uh, of working with uh, uh, Commissioner Sheehan some years ago when I was Commissioner Department of Environmental Services. And this issue of how we're going to pay for uh, the, the, the maintenance of our roads as our vehicle fleet makes its transition to electricity has actually been something that's been kicked around by the legislature for probably close to 10 years now. And if, if I recall correctly, uh, Commissioner, one of the things that came up at the time was the issue of, of as I understood at the time, that one of the most significant impacts on road conditions is actually the weight of the vehicles. And so I'm curious as to whether you've given any thought to how weight of vehicles and maybe vehicle miles traveled could be incorporated together into a rate structure that recognizes um, the impacts of the roads overall, but perhaps in some ways does sort of view that set of externalities of transportation in connection with the other positive benefits, externalities that we might get from using our, our batteries as, as something more than just a battery for the car, as a battery that, that can feed our overall economy. So when we design our highway infrastructure, we're designing it for trucks and heavier vehicles today. And so yes, you know, a, electric passenger vehicle is heavier than a traditional vehicle, um, but it's you know, an order of magnitude heavier. At the end of the day, what we're most curious about is what happens with the heavy fleets. Will they be electric? Will they be hydrogen? Um, and what will the weight of those vehicles be? Because that's the vehicle size that ultimately we design our infrastructure to support, is those larger vehicles. And so, yes, weight plays a role today in how we charge people to use the system. And um, those heavier trucks do pay more in registration. So we, weight is already a factor. Whether or not it needs to be a factor as we talk about the passenger fleet um, is something that the legislature would have to look at. And certainly there has been bills, as we've talked about an interim solution, you know, a registration surcharge type solution. There's been different representatives who put forward proposals where you'd look at the weight of the vehicle as well as the fuel efficiency to figure out, again, what you would have been paying in gas tax, um, or road toll as we call it, and and um, how do we close the gap in the short term? Um, but like I said, these are, these are really challenging things to grapple with, and um, that's why there has been a hesitancy to take action. And so it has been about a 10-year conversation, um, and a lot of times, as I said earlier, we're looking to the federal government to see what solution they ultimately adopt. And vehicle miles travel keeps coming back around because if we track how much you're driving and using the system, as opposed to applying a fee on top of how you fuel the vehicle, um, that might be a fairer way to do things. Um, but I think our legislature is also equally sensitive to the imperfections in our current system today. You know, if you live in a rural area and you have to drive a long distance, then you're paying more to use the system because, yes, you're using the system, um, but with all the other challenges we have in society today from a lack of affordable housing and you know, the need to ensure that workers have access to jobs, um, these are tough nuts to crack, which is why I, I keep saying it. I really empathize with our elected leaders who ultimately have to make a decision. And the timing of when we need to make the decision really depends on the rate of adoption um, and how quickly people start to purchase these significantly more fuel efficient vehicles. So a question for Ethan. Uh, so Ethan, this concept of metered energy efficiency, metered savings, do you see kind of wider application? For it, so something like measurement verification studies or current programs, energy efficiency programs that are using modeling extensively, uh, whether it's a systems program, other programs like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a uh, ultimately, I think, to the extent that efficiency programs are trying to, um, you know, adapt to the the new model of you know decarbonization or fuel switching because of the new technology that's coming out there's a really rapid transition that we need to go through with a lot of the efficiency work that we're doing. 
And I think that the model we had of doing modeled savings was a great one when um, we had light bulbs and slide rules, right? And we needed to come up with, okay, it wasn't quite that bad. But it, you know, we, we had to come up with a good enough answer to, to make some mass decisions. And now we need to have uh, a lot of efficiency deployed. It's all gonna interact. There's a lot of new technologies coming in. I, you know, I work to support one of my, one of my clients is the you know, EPA Energy Star for smart thermostats. How do you come up with a bench test for the efficiency of a smart thermostat when the goal is to help a human make a better decision about how to configure their schedule? They, they couldn't come up with one. We use the data instead to figure out how each one of the different vendors is able to ac accomplish a good setback schedule for all customers, right? And so that's a constant feedback loop. Every six months, we're getting fresh data in from all the vendors. And so if they make some change to their software, and all of a sudden, they have little animations playing all the time, but they no longer help you make a good schedule, they're going to lose their badge, and they're not going to be Energy Star certified anymore, right? We have this huge lag with energy efficiency evaluation, A, three to five years, and then you get a report back, and by that time, you've already changed your program, so what's that feedback doing for you? Um, and B, most of the time, the feedback isn't really very specific, right? Overall, doing a thousand projects, something messed up, at eh, 50%, what do you do differently, right? What worked and what didn't work? So we don't have really an effective feedback loop, and again, when we were doing light bulbs, that was not the biggest problem we had to, to deal with out there. In today's world, yes. It needs to be, you know, I think integrated into all the parts so we have the same information informing regulation and operation and the folks out in the field and making the plans. Absolutely. What's going on here? Sometimes I feel like uh, we, we see this whole um, gas tax thing in one way. We're, we're the people using the roads, so we should pay for the roads. Why don't we see that for a carbon tax? That's all I can ask. Maybe it's a rhetorical question. It's a rhetorical question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I was rather shocked by the numbers of electric vehicles that are coming to the in New Hampshire. And I was looking at our declining revenue, uh, our gas tolls, you will. Um, and I'm wondering if the problem really is lying elsewhere inside the non taxation of electric vehicles. It seems like that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the two main cars that are going to be captured. So as we've discussed the lost revenue um, with the legislature, we've talked about lost revenue due to fuel efficiency. So it's not just the hybrid and electric vehicles. Like I said, they're the most fuel efficient. Um, it's the, you know, over time, every single vehicle on the road today is more fuel efficient. And so the, the road toll revenue has been declining. But again, I want to give credit to the legislature. Um, they have found other ways to fund transportation. And so, you know, they're we're doing in New Hampshire what the federal government's been doing and using general funds and other sources of revenue. Uh, but you know, previously, the goal was for transportation to be self-sufficient, that we would generate the revenue to fund the investments that were necessary. Over time, we've been moving away from that because of all this uncertainty as to what's going to happen in the industry. But it's, it's not just this giant leap now to full electrification. It's been a gradual um, decline because of overall um, changes in the miles per gallon per vehicle. Right. Uh, so wouldn't it make more sense for, uh, to uh, look at the actual flame all vehicles because of fuel efficiency rather than us look at one segment the other? So that's why some of the bills that were fees just for hybrid electric vehicles did not move forward. There was some in the legislature that thought we had to have more of a wholesale solution. Um, and this is, this is the great debate that's been going on. Sure. Anybody else? <laughs> I have one back here. One more question for Don. Um, you're not a legislator, Don. Do you have a synthetic ear? Someone will introduce your bill. And do you attend the conversation? Uh, I, I guess I would respectfully defer answering that question until November 9th. <laughs> <laughs>